Alrighty, welcome back to part two. Um, so let's kind of finish up where we were on abstract expressionism. Um, William de Kooning is another abstract expressionist art artist, but um, he's not quite as non-representational as um, Jackson Pollock was. So he still uses very spontaneous brushwork, um, provocative use of shapes, has a human figure that underlies many of his paintings, not all, but a lot of them like this piece here, um, Woman and Bicycle, where it's um, it, it, obviously the imagery is the subject matter is not in nature um, provocative, but just the application of paint, um, this like heavy, really sort of messy brushwork that he's doing um, and the depiction of the figure itself is um, very unlike anything that we have seen prior to this, um, almost done in a intentionally bad way. Um, but but again, just trying to capture like raw feeling and emotion rather than um, and just the process in general, the the nature of paint um in in a painting that we haven't really seen before um we do see some abstract expressionism um in sculpture as well david smith is one of these artists um he has this piece here and many others in his QB series where the cubist framework um has a very elemental energy to it where it's it's almost like a simplification of, of cubism which is you know in a way sort of abstract expressionism um, it's based on just masses and planes and um, balance um, above the viewer's eye level. Um, some color field paintings that also come out during this time. This is a painting that consists of large areas of color um, that are, you know, typically pretty flat and, and two dimensional. There's no obvious structure or central focus or dynamic balance. So again, like I said, we're I'm not trying to justify these different movements, but in a way, I sort of am because. Now, today in 2023, when um, we, you know, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is it's already been done or everything that we're talking about has already happened. But up until there was so much room for play and like, you know, just doing things that hadn't been done before um, that movements like color field painting, um, people were just doing it because they could really, and they were just seeing what could happen, seeing what could be accepted or, you know, um, liked or disliked. And, and so that, that came with a lot of different angles. So, um, Mark Roth, Rothko, he's a color field painter, early pioneer, pioneer in this, this style. Um, it's really simplified, very minimal art, um, it, where this composition is just called blue, orange, and red. It's um, just thin layers of paint um, kind of organized in a very um, sensuous appeal. It has very monumental presence to it, but we're just really stripping it down to the basics here. Um, another color filled painter, I, I like her work. I think Rothko is like the more known name in color filled painting, but um, Helen Frankenthaler is a name that I like a lot better. Um, her color field painting still very flat and two-dimensional but she's sort of playing with um kind of what paint can do in a non-traditional way um actually like physically so what she does here is um she uses a straining technique where she'll stretch her canvas but um and if you kind of know the, the process of like stretching your own canvas and making your own canvases um what you would need to do is make your frame first that's just has no you know actual canvas or you know part of the middle it's just like the framework the four boards or four you know pieces of wood and then you stretch your fabric over the top of it um and then you prime it traditionally to get you know the, a very cohesive sort of you know a good buildable layer um but if you don't do that just imagine if you um you know had a piece of cloth or something and you spilled um cranberry juice on it or you know whatever it would start to seep up and sort of spread out. It wouldn't just stay in the one spot. And so that's kind of what she was doing here is just letting the color spread and almost like paint itself in a lot of ways. And then, you know, organizing her compositions around the way things naturally occurred. Um, this came with a lot of uh, fluid organic shapes um, and a lot of spontaneity as well. So let's talk about architecture at the mid-century. So we, again, we've already talked about some of these styles, but international style also is sort of, you know, going on alongside of like modern architecture as well, um, like with Frank Lloyd Wright. But international style is um, a simplification of shapes. We, we look for this like steel and glass box look that we see in a lot of our skyscrapers today. Um, it represented America corporations um, and, and sort of like they're almost like robotic sort of, you know, leaning really heavily into... Um, this industrial revolution, this sort of like, you know, era of capitalism and 
um, just, you know, working production, that sort of thing. Um, I, I definitely lean myself more into like the Frank Lloyd Wrights than like the international style architects. Um, but it's just what was going on at the time. You know, it's, it, it's something new. It's something, you know, we're wanting everything to seem really um, just well oiled, um, just working really well together. But um, we're moving away from like the federal style, which is more sort of like ornamentation centric and, um, you know, still very serious trying to est establish sort of our, our, um, uh, I don't know, our, our power and our um, stability, but in a different way. Uh, so events and happenings, this is, this is a movement I love to talk about, um, events and happenings. There is essentially nothing that is off the table, um, as far as what art can be. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that art has to be defined as a, uh, like aesthetic object. It can be a moment in time. And again, I've talked about Black Mountain College already in this lesson, but again, Black Mountain College sort of like allowed the space for these types of things to happen, um, as well as other parts of the world were doing similar things around the time as well. But I like to talk about Black Mountain College because it's this collaborative space where, you know, dancers could overlap with painters and, you know, when they collaborated, you know, what was the result of that? Um, and th that's kind of where these led to, how these began to occur. Um, this is uh, essentially the events and happenings are where artists begin to create living and moving art events that, um, are defiant on time and space. So um, Gyutai, which is, um, I mean, embodiment, is a movement in, Japanese, or in Japan um, where art could be an event rather than an object. This is um, a Saburo Murakami um, who is does some of the earliest examples of this. Uh, this is around 1956. And this performance called Passing Through, um, he symbolically destroyed blank sheets of paper and mounted, mounted on frames in his performance. So he just kind of ran through these pieces. Um, and this foreshadowed the events that would happen, the events and happenings that would happen in the West later on. But um, yeah, so I mean, with these these movements, with these events happening, Skutai, um, all of those, the the idea is that you physically being there is important for this. So having to occupy the space with the artist, and and you know, the artist being sort of the the artwork in this in this case. Um, so kind of stepping away from like this, the really far out kind of <laughs> examples of this, like this piece here. Um, Jean Tingley is, uh, an artist as well who creates events and happenings and, um, also kinetic sculpture. So he makes machines that work in very unexpected ways. Um, and, and sometimes they end up, you know, falling apart or, you know, it, it really just depends on what, what's going on. It's just, you know, you have to kind of be there to know what's going to happen that the artist maybe himself doesn't even know. Homage to New York was a, um, a sculpture piece that he designed that was meant to self-destruct at the end. And so obviously, I mean, you can look at videos and look at, um, you know, different photographs and things like that, but the spontaneity and like the, the happening, um, it's really unpredictable. It's, it, it has to do a lot with like, you know, thinking about ideas and concepts, such as fate and, you know, how much of a choice we really have in things. Um, and how much is just left up to, you know, the circumstances around us, because although, you know, he knows it's going to self-destruct, he doesn't know, is it going to, you know, is a shard going to fly out of it and like, you know, break a glass window, or is it going to be, you know, rather calm and, you know, not disruptive? He doesn't really know. Um, happenings are cooperative events in which viewers become active partic participants. Um, and this is one that is partly planned, but partly spontaneous. So, um, this piece here would be considered a happening because it did rely on the viewer's participation in this and, you know, actually being there to see the end of it. Alan Caprow, um, he first used this word happening, um, and this is his piece, Household. There are no spectators in this piece. There is only participants. So um, participants are given objects um, and then just some, like, directive um, men are just meant to, meant to build a tower, and women were meant to uh, build a nest. And then at the end of it, both of them destroyed each other's works and that's what they were supposed to do. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, he's giving some instruction and um, some props, some, some objects and things, but really the, the participants are the ones that decide how this is going to go. Um, moving on, we've got our pop art. 
Um, this incorporates real objects or mass production techniques. Um, it's sort of this overlap. There's a lot of capitalism is like, you know, at all time high here. We're around like the 1950s and um, or not, maybe not an all time high. We're, we're kind of in an all time high of capitalism right now. Um, but, you know, we start to see this like overproduction of things. Everything is, is being commodified. And um, and so we start to kind of like, you know, get our art involved with that as well. Um, photographic screen printing becomes really popular as well, where we can kind of like produce things like one after the other, after the other, and it be very uniform, um, has a very, pop art is known to have a very sleek look and ironic attitude that separates pop art works from assemblages. Um, Richard Hamilton, uh, published a list of pop art qualities. Um, it's just, what is it that makes today's home so different? So appealing. Um, this is one of his pieces that he did. And it's a parody of superficiality and materialism on popular culture. Um, it's, it's it's hard to it's hard to really say what is pop art though. There's there's definitely characteristics that define it, um, but it but it's it's sort of a combination of a lot of things. There's um, you know sort of a, a collage assemblage to it, but also sort of like a sarcasm that's underlying it, or just something that you know is there that it, you sometimes are in on the joke, but sometimes you're not. Maybe. Um, also, I'm not sure if I've included this video in our Ed Puzzle folder this time, but um, if, if it's there, watch the pop art video as well, please. Um, Andy Warhol is our big name in pop art. He is very interested in um, pr producing, you know, already commodifiable objects like um, Kellogg's cornflakes or, um, you know, Campbell's tomato soup cans um, and even people sometimes. So, um, he is the most visible artist in pop art for sure um, and uses consumer products um, as subjects like the Kellogg's cornflake boxes. So um, he, you know, replicates this design and enabled the public to access um, or assess omnipresent impact of mass marketing. So when we see this out in like the grocery store, it's one thing. But when we see it in an art gallery and we're being asked to examine it in a way that we haven't before, um, it, it really changes the context of it. Um, like I said, sometimes he commodifies or he he thinks about how people, how celebrities, um, people in pop culture are commodified in a way. They're sort of selling themselves. Um, and Marilyn Monroe was definitely one of those and still is today, um, even in her legacy, is is this almost commodity. Um, we, we know her as being this figure, this um, this representation of this idea, this, um, you know, this time period, this lifestyle, all of this. And um, I mean, really think about today, we have so many commodified people, um, whether they're celebrities or influencers or, you know, whatever, they're really selling who they are as a person, um, rather than having an object to go along with that, that you can physically touch and have, um, you're sort of buying into their ideas and their beliefs and, you know, what they, what they do and who they are. Um, talking about minimal art just a little bit, again, Moving back to that that conversation I had during the color field paintings conversation, um, minimal art is referring to nothing outside of itself. It is just breaking things down to the most simple um, elements and principles that there are. Donald Judd is a minimal artist who uses sheet metal and other industrial materials in their work. Um, this is untitled work of 1967. There is no story. There's no personal expression. There's no content. It just is a focus on the color and the form and just looking at things totally straight down. Um, another minimal artist. I, I, this one's really interesting. It's um, suppressing the brush strokes is sort of like the, the idea here and sort of um, favoring more of like this, uh, this uniform, you know, all the same application which is not something that paint really naturally lends itself to. We more so want paint to be more messy, especially when we look at like abstract expressionism, which is all about the messiness of it. Um, whereas this artist, um, Ellsworth Kelly, is just trying to suppress that at all cost. Um, Site-specific work and earthworks, um, another sort of movement that's going on early 1970s, I would say. It's the artist's response to the location that determines the composition, the scale, the medium, and the content of the piece. So think about like the, the Frank Lloyd Wrights of like the sculpture and uh, installation and painting side of, of art. Um, Christo and Jean-Claude are two earthwork designers um, that are 
really, really well known for their large scale pieces. Um, this piece is a temporary work of art using um, fabric. And so they've just ran this line of fabric through the landscape to obstruct it and sort of like, you know, just offer something different that's not there and sort of making you have something to compare the landscape to rather than just like the vastness of what it is the landscape. Um, the ribbon of white cloth captured the wind also. So it sort of uh, made the wind currents that were only something that you could feel look as if they were an actual thing. You could actually see them, you know, moving and changing. Um, si more site specific works. Um, this is Walter de Maria's lightning field, um, where 400 stainless steel poles were arranged in New Mexico. I think this piece is really interesting because, um, this artist is trying to control something that does not lead itself to being controlled, which is lightning. You know, we never really know where lightning is going to strike at exactly. Um, uh, it's not something that can be totally controlled, but by organizing these, um, these rods in this way and knowing that, you know, lightning is going to sort of, you know, relate to those he sort of harnesses power and energy into something that is extremely chaotic and d deals with this sort of dichotomy between chaos and control um earthworks are specifically earthworks are sculptural forms made from earth rocks and sometimes plants so you know whereas here the lightning i guess can be considered the earthwork but the lightning rods are are something that is not natural um so it's sort of a little bit in between Earthworks, though, um, it has to be made from something that's coming from the earth and and from like the, in its natural form. Um, Robert Smithson is a founder in the Earthworks movement. He created the Spiral Jetty, which is in the Great Salt Lake of Utah. Um, you've maybe seen this before. Just like, I mean, if you've been to Utah, you've maybe gone to see it. But um, this is, you know, something that it's in nature that would really never occur in this way. And so I think seeing it in this like organized way that we don't normally see nature similar to this sort of like what he's trying to achieve controlling something that naturally does not want to be controlled um but it looks natural because the material is natural this is something that you would you know see in nature but not naturally occurring in this way this is like the the presence of human life are evident here due to the design um, some things to note is uh, site-specific work and earthworks is almost never sold. Um, that is not really, they're, they're sort of going against the idea of commodities and um, pop art and sort of, you know, what they were about. Uh, it's, it's thinking art as an experience, again, not a commodity. Um, installations. So these are sort of going off of like the, the earthworks and site-specific work. But um, it's when there is fabricated interior installations and environment, um, usually not portable. Uh, Geoi Kusama, who's one of my favorite artists of all times, um, a big name artist anyway, um, she creates a lot of installations. You've maybe seen one of these before. Um, they're, they're installed all over, you know, all the time and they sort of travel. But um, this is uh, one of her obsessive installations, um, Fallis Field. And what she does is she'll, she'll create something. It could be these like little organic shapes here with the dots on them, or it could be pumpkins or she has lots of different actual like subjects that she uses, but she designs these mirror installations where it looks like these go on forever. And this relates back to a lot of her, um, her mental illness that she has, her sort of like obsessive uh, compulsive disorder, um, stress, anxiety, um, depression. Uh, I think she has schizophrenia as well. And just trying to make us see the world as she experiences it um, in a very, you know, different way. Um, so yeah, this is one of her pieces. I would highly recommend watching the, uh, and and you're going to be required to it because it is counted with our, um, our participation credit, but watch the polka dots interactive installation that we have listed here. I will include that in the Ed puzzle folder, but um, it's showing one of her installations that she's done. And it also is a bit performative as well. Um, okay, early feminism um, and how that sort of made its way into art. This is around 1979 where as we, um, you know, I don't know when, who exactly is taking these classes. If you're in high school, if you've, you know, experienced these, um, these time periods and kind of what was going on in the world. But um, we, we really, it's, it's really crazy how long it takes 
women to show up in art. Um, and even if they were participating to really know female artists before the seventies is difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, you have, you can find them, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's not natural. It's not something that just is, it's there naturally. And so early feminism art is um, art that seeks to challenge the dominance of men in both art and society to gain recognition and equally and uh, equality for women artists and um, question assumptions about womanhood. So um, the piece that I, I think is the most important to show here um, is the dinner party by Judy Chicago, which is, is very, very well known, but um, the idea is that we are literally putting a spot at the table, bringing a spot to the table for women in our society and in art. Um, this is a collaborative project by many, many women um, where we or where she has made this triangle, which is a um, the, the symbol of the triangle is um, that of feminism and, and of women in general. Um, but each dinner place set is is for a different, um, important female figure and um, they're each curated to their style their you know personality their um, different just what it is that they are you know bringing to the table so um, again it, it's they're all you know hand embroidered handmade it's it's all very very collaborative and um, really really impressive to see in person so um, performance art, which it sort of is, is leaning into like the happenings and events, but it's a little bit different. Um, it, it's, it's definitely influenced by, they're inspired by those though. Um, performance art is when actions are performed before an audience or nature. Um, it's when there is visual art and drama kind of combined or theatrics combined. Artists eliminate the object and concentrate on the event itself instead. Um, Anna Mendetta is an artist that um, she is a feminist artist, but she's also a performance artist. Um, and this piece here, she covers her body with mud and stood against an ancient tree trunks to sort of like, you know, talk about this relationship between nature and of women and um, kind of blending in or just sort of like sinking back into nature. Um, my all time favorite, 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 favorite <laughs> Marina Abramovich. I love her so much. Um, she is the powerhouse of performance art and um, is really known for her risky and extreme performance pieces. Um, Marina Ronovich is very controversial, I would say. Um, if you don't know who she is, I would definitely look her up, kind of, you know, look at some of her different art films that she has made, um, different projects that she has done. Um, the Artist is Present is um, a piece that she did with her long, long uh, life partner, Yule, who um, they reunited during this piece after 25 years of being apart. Um, they uh, originally were, we, they worked together. They were like a pair, but um, they made a decision to separate both um, romantically and um, artistically as well. Um, and then they, they reconnect in this piece. So definitely, definitely watch that one. It's, it's very, very sweet. Um, and she's also, as far as I can tell, does not expect it to happen, but um, it's one of her performance pieces where she asks the audience or asks people to um, sit with her at a table and have uninterrupted eye contact for an amount of time. There's no words being spoken, but um, it's just all about connection, human connection. Um, and yeah, so definitely watch that one. And then also um, there is a music video by Jay-Z called Picasso Baby. You've maybe heard the song before. It's a very long song. The, the music video is like 10 minutes or something. Um, but uh, Marina Abramovich is a guest on his video, or like the main, main guest. And, um, anyway, I just think this video is, is really, really awesome. I think that, you know, nothing against Jay-Z or anything, but, um, I think that he's, I have mixed feelings about this, this performance piece, bringing music into the art gallery and kind of what that means for, you know, just as a collaboration, how, you know, rap differs from like, you know, our visual arts category. Um, but Marina Abramovich is, there's lots of celebrities in this music video. Um, I can, and I could talk about it forever. I could, I could write a thesis about, <laughs> about this music video. Uh, but there's lots of other performers and different artists and, you know, designers and, you know, artistic people in this video. But uh, Marina Abramovich is, she really differs from those. I think that she, she brings a whole different conversation to, what this piece is about so you watch it um I've watched it hundreds of times now probably um 
and you know evaluate it as much as you want to or just watch it the one time it's a great music video either way um and it also you know shows a lot of cool guests as well so um where are we at today um this was definitely in our current realm of things but um let's talk about kind of what is going on now um so today we are in our postmodern contemporary art period that is our, our category that we are in currently um, there is this urge to rebel the norm that uh, lost impact when the rebellion became normal. Um, there's very few rules left to break, and present generation artists prefer to comment on life rather than perfect form, create beauty, and fine tune sight. So we're just really trying to see what else is out there. We're, um, you know, using our newest technology, our newest um, developments, and things like that, and integrating them into what art is. And, you know, just the conversation's changing constantly every day. Um, there's a lot of also relationships between what we see and how we think about things. And so those, those two are, are big proponents as well. Um, some architecture, there's a departure from the sterile glass box look of international style. Um, buildings are, are no longer the same as, at least in our, um, you know, really heavy design oriented architecture. Um, there is an influence of creative, creative thinkers from the 19th and 20th century, like Frank Lloyd Wright. Zaha Hadid, um, Philip Johnson, et cetera, are some big names. This is Zaha Hadid's um, London Aquatic Center. I love the playfulness here, the balance um, as well, like the symmetry, the sort of asymmetry that we've got going on. Um, yeah, and, and just the, the there is a great consideration of, of applying principles of art and design into architecture in a way that they have not been done before. Michael Graves, um, this is the public service building that he has created and designed. Um, there's a lot of playfulness um, that is both formal and um, just sort of, you know, having fun as well. Um, playing with color, playing with um, symmetry, playing with just, you know, essential de design elements, even like the windows, how they all differ depending on where they're at on the building. Um, yeah, just really interesting piece. Um, painting, we have fallen into this neo-expressionism category. So sort of like a nuanced um, abstract expressionism. There's a return to portraying the representational subject matter with a heightened sense of emotionalness and roughness. So artists like um, Jean uh, Basquiat is uh, a big name in our neo-expressionist movement who, you know, takes components from the past and sort of twists them and, you know, makes them new in the future. Uh, Carrie James Marshall, um, love Carrie James Marshall, is a really, really great artist from like the late 90s um, and early 2000s. Um, he creates artwork or paintings that are optimistic, but they are not in idyllic uh, depictions that they like take place in. So this is one of his pieces here. It's uh, Better Homes, Better Gardens, done in 1994. And he's portraying a um, couple that walks down a flowered pathway um, in a low rise setting. And um, this is a, this is like the projects basically. And, you know, which is normally not depicted, especially like in photographs as being a very positive place, very optimistic place. However, he is sort of seeing this through a different type of lens than we're used to seeing it in. Um, please watch the Carrie James Marshall Art 21 talk in the Ed Puzzle folder as well. Um, and also within painting, we have relational aesthetics, which um, this this is a movement that rose in popularity in the 1990s. Um, artists renounced control over the development and final appearance of their work. And I've, I've sort of tiptoed around this conversation a bit uh, in previous pieces where we talked about like the kinetic sculpture of Jean Tingley and, you know, not really knowing what the end result of something's going to be and letting sort of fate take over. The, um, the artist will create a situation that depends on the viewer. So, for example, at Angela Bullock's um, Betaville is a, um, a piece that is, I guess, a happening is what you would say. But it is dependent on how the viewer moves throughout the, the gallery. So the motion sensor will paint lines on a wall in response to the viewer's movement. And so depending on how many viewers come in, how they walk around the space depends on what the end result is going to be. So she knows relatively how it's going to look, but not, not actually physically how it's going to, to end up. Uh, sculpture, there is an exploration of value, shape, space, and form. So kind of, you know, that abstraction into sculpture, we're, we're still sort of playing with that idea, the simplification of things, how, you know, objects occupy spaces. And, and that's, that's really, you know, kind of breaking it down to very simple elements and principles. Um, Yeyo Kusama, who we talked about for the installations as well, but 
She's also a sculpture artist. Um, she creates these pumpkins. This is a very popular shape for her um, in her artwork that has all these repetitive dots on it. And um, she's very well known for investigating form that is very similar, like a pumpkin or a gourd, and placing it in a new environment that it doesn't naturally exist in to make us question it further. Um, exploration of materials. I've said this before, but almost anything or any substance can be a material or a medium within art. Um, Mike Kelly, I believe I've maybe already shown this piece very early on in our first lesson that we ever did. Um, he uses stuffed animals and materials for, or as materials for large installation sculptures. So all of the, um, the material and the medium that he's used here is, is using stuffed animals. So I wouldn't say there is one sculpture medium that's like, you know, you're going to take a sculpture class and you're going to use this material. It is totally free reign nowadays. And, and people really, I think, are excited to see what artists use as their materials. Um, we also have 3D printing, which is a new kind of innovation in sculpture. Um, this is the newest technology available. Josh Klein, he is a um, sculpture artist and a 3D art, 3D design artist. Um, it's tastemaker choice where he begins with a high resolution photo of something that he wants to 3D print. And then he'll create 3D models and adjust the size, color, texture, material it's made from. Um, it's very experimental. Public art. Um, this is a federal mandate um, that one half of one half percent of the cost of all public buildings um, be spent on art to embellish them. So this just makes it to where we don't have just a bunch of stale, you know, boring places that people don't want to actually live in. But it's it's just, you know, totally about the robotic, you know, working environment. It's not anything there's no balance really um and so we have to have a little bit of this this budget kind of directed towards the arts um which one half of one half percent maybe doesn't sound like a lot but if you're talking about like a billion dollar building that's being made in the government i mean one half of one half percent of a billion dollars is you know it's significant for sure um I love this piece. It's by Buster Simpson. It's called Instrument Implement Walla Walla Campanile. Um, and it is a computer, in the idea behind it, it is, you know, an actual physical piece that you can look at, but um, it has a actual like purpose and function. So there's a computer that encodes data from the water temperatures and the flow levels of the river that this is on. And um, it uh, shows, it tells you with a musical tone that's coming out from these different parts here, um, the health and the um, sort of just like state of the river. And I, I think this piece is great because it really makes the public aware of like their environment and what's happening in their community. If the, the machine starts to make really bad noises or, you know, whatever, then it will indicate that like this is to everybody that's that's walking by like, hey, like the river's polluted or, you know, how is not healthy. We need to get somebody on that and then people you know will sort of press for that to happen and you know it's not just something that's sort of put under the rug you know um public art though can be made in almost any medium I think we think about it most as being sculpture um however uh paintings can also be um public art as well Catherine Opie um her series somewhere in the middle is a series of photographs taken from the same pot spot during all seasons and different times of day, different weather conditions, all of that. Very, very simplified, but um, they're very different depending on when she has taken them. This is just a water line, essentially, that's going on there and the sky and the, the water that's there. And this is installed in the Cleveland Hospital. Um, it's it's very intentional. I think that it is, um, it very so relates to, you know, the the viewer and the audience that are going to be looking at these um so when you walk down the corridor it, it sort of is meant to give you like a slow passage of time um it almost becomes like a meditative thing whereas you know hospital environments are lean themselves to being very high stakes um a lot of tension anxiety stress involved and so i think that her intention with this was just to kind of bring us back down to earth for a little bit and um, to, to make us aware of, you know, our environment and where we're at and, um, you know, just sort of get in touch with our senses a little bit. Um, public art, we've got street art. So this is when artists take the initiative to create work um, for a public view without waiting for the commission. Traditionally, street art is very much discouraged. <laughs> we, we don't like street art for a very long time, uh, but now it's often created or installed um, 
intentionally, like with, you know, money involved <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, but we see a lot of street art initially being stencils. We talked about stencils in our printmaking chapter and how we can, um, you know, do street art very quickly with stencils if we're trying to get away with it and, you know, not be caught. Um, Banksy is is one of those artists um, who is, who's a street artist and Banksy is anonymous. We do not know who they are. Um, and that's sort of like the appeal, I think, is that, um, you know, street art, a lot of the time you don't have a name to to go back to. And if you did, then that person would probably get in a lot of trouble. But um, he, he likes his anonymous um, identity, I think, or, or she or they. Um, most definitely kind of brought street art into being more seen in a valid way than it had been before. Um, this is one of the pieces here, but people all the time, it was almost like a game or like a, a, a puzzle or a, something that you were in on to know who Banksy was because he would tag things like this and, um, and then people would, you know, not know who it was, but then they'd see the signature and be like, oh, this is, a, you know, Banksy's new piece. Um, but that's sort of, you know, the anonymous nature of it, I think sort of plays into what he's, he's interested in with, which is. Banksy is more of an idea rather than a singular person. Um, anyone who signs Banksy's name could be Banksy. Um, would really highly encourage you to watch. This is not required because it is very long. Um, but Exit Through the Gift Shop, which is a documentary on Netflix where Banksy or maybe Banksy or, you know, someone with their, you know, a hood over their head and um, a voice changer is talking about their work and about the history of street art that um, I'd highly, highly recommend watching. And it's on Netflix. Um, let's talk about socially conscious art and globalization and kind of like, you know, those over overlaps into the art world. So many artists seek to link art to current social questions and social happenings. Um, limiting art to aesthetic matter, it's provided a distraction from pressing problems when we actually just confront it head on. Um, we can get a lot of attention that way. Barbara Kruger is one to, to kind of be this figure. Um, she invented the slogan, um, I shop, therefore I am and the hand positioning that we see here. And it provoked the question of whether products define us. And if we are what we shop for, are we just a commodity or, you know, do we have individualism anymore? And the interesting, I think kind of like ironic part about this, um, this whole thing was that she later uh, silk screened this onto shopping bags that then became a commodity amongst themselves. And, you know, you can go on Amazon and type in, I shop, therefore I am tote bag and you can buy it for $12 and you know then I don't know there's a lot of irony I think in her work and and she she wants us to think about the things that we we have and the things that are you know our physical self is it's telling other people um some art transforms social problems into work that pulls us in using beauty and um and you know prettiness but it ends up being something that is um, more serious and, and, you know, not quite as optimistic. Um, Tiffany Chung, she uses this, uh, this method with her pieces. This is a UNHCR, um, red dot series. And this depicts the, although it kind of looks like flowers and like the colors are, you know, very pastel and pretty, um, this is depicting the flow of Syrian refugees over an eight month period. Um, and so if we look at this, it becomes like this map almost. Um, and really all we need to know is the, um, the titles and she's very, like on the nose about the titles. It's not, you know, leaving anything up to interpretation. It's like, this is what this is. And, you know, it, she uses this beauty to br bring us in. Whereas um, on the other hand, we see artists like um, Imran uh, Kriyashi, who uses sort of like goriness to sort of initially push us away. But then um, when we look closer, there is beauty in it. So um, this is uh, you who are my love and my life's enemy too. Um, Imran is a Pakistani artist and at first look, this looks like puddles of blood. Um, if we look closer at it, it's actually flowers and, um, like carnations and instead of being blood. So sort of is the opposite of, of, uh, what Tiffany Chung does. Um, this is, uh, Naomi, um, Winjiku and, uh, this is routes of migration. Um, Naomi is a Kenyan artist who noticed the shades and colors on the corroded, uh, or corroded tin roofs and, um, you know, thought that, I guess they thought that the the design or like the colors were really pretty and very fluid and, you know, but actually this is sort of talking about the state of a place rather than, um, and also just, you know, this idea of migration and how, why people are migrating and 
um, you know, what's causing this, but it's sort of drawing us in with this, um, this unconventional material and um, to allude to something that is, you know, not so pretty, not so, so clean and nice. A uh, big name in socially conscious art and globalization um, is Ai Weiwei. Um, I love Ai Weiwei. He's a very controversial artist as well. He's been to jail several times for his artwork. Um, and he is not so much just an artist, but he is known to be a global visual activist is sort of his title. Um, he has this piece and it's one of his, weirdly, one of his more toned down pieces called Sunflower Seed Installation that involves an entire local community um, in the area that he is from to create a large scale composite um, compilation or cosmopolitan art gallery. Um, I always tries to invoke to, and discourage surrounding social issues in China. And he's often placed under arrest and has spent several time or spent time in prison for his art activism. Um, we do have a video for him as well. It's the sunflower seeds installation. And so when you see the sunflower seed installation, it's, you know, you don't see all the stuff that is in the video. Um, but each one of these sunflower seeds, just to give you a little idea, a little teaser trailer, whatever, um, each one of these is actually porcelain and it has been hand painted. And all of that space in the background there are these sunflower seeds and they're deep. <laughs> it's about two or three feet of sunflower seeds. It's not just, you know, enough to fill the surface. It's, it's a lot of them. And this community that he involves um, is the one who produces them. So definitely watch this one. It's a really beautiful video. So what's next? Um, everyday artists are exploring, inventing, observing, and researching new ways to expand our understanding of art. Um, all that needs to be done now is to wait for the what the future brings and never stop thinking creatively. So um, we're pretty much caught up as to where we are now. Um, things change rapidly. Um, new things are happening all the time. Um, and so I encourage you to keep exploring, keep, um, you know, trying to visit art galleries and use this new information that you've gained from this class to um, apply that to, you know, looking at artwork and thinking about artwork and really, you know, what it's doing for us in a social and a political way as well. Um, but yeah, this is our last video. Um, you are officially done with all of the Ed puzzles and all of the lessons. So um, I appreciate you listening and I hope you enjoyed it.